You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network. to sharpen those swords. You're listening to Saber Semantics, a hard-hitting interview and discussion show featuring players, alumni, media, and all others who have or still cover the NHL's Buffalo Sabres. With interesting stories from the past and current objective analysis, this show is sure to provide an entertaining and unique perspective for both Sabres and hockey fans alike. Oh, brother, we are not worthy! Exclusively on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Now, here's your host of Sabres Semantics, Brandon Caputo. Welcome in to another installment of Sabres Semantics right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Proudly brought to you by j Flooring. If you think you can get a better deal anywhere else, you don't know Jack. Contact our Niagara Falls location to begin your next quality flooring project today. The proud show sponsor of Sabre Semantics. As always, make sure you're following uh, the show on X, I guess, not Twitter anymore, X. I've had a hard time saying that lately. But uh, at Sabre Semantics, you can follow myself at bcaputo underscore AGM. And my co-host I'm on the right on the video version right there at Austin underscore broad. Uh, we're available for you guys on video uh, on YouTube. So if if you're enjoying the video version of the content, make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, and smash that bell for all updates on video versions of our podcast that get released here on the network. And to those listening and on demand in audio, thank you very much for doing that. You can also find all of our content on our website, armchairgmsports.com. As you can see on the thumbnail, Saber Season Preview. Today is the opening day of the regular season for the Buffalo Sabres, and I'm pleased to welcome in Austin for uh, the first installment of many uh, episodes this season. Whether it's going to be on a weekly or bi-weekly basis with this show is going to kind of depend on uh, how much the Sabres are playing and what kind of news they give us to talk about. So, um, Austin, thanks so much for uh, coming on again. I, I, we were relaunching the show with a new name, but uh, we've been talking Sabres for probably five years now, and it's just great to, to finally you know start doing it again. And, and you know how much I appreciate having you on, and, and there's nobody I'd rather talk Sabres with. Oh, absolutely, man. Happy to help you out and happy to be a part of this. It's uh, Like you said, we've been talking about Sabres for a long time, so might as well just record it. Exactly. So uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in today. So uh, we might as well get started uh, with our first segment today, and that's going to be brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family. Visit any of their four great Niagara region locations. The proud show sponsor of our Dog Pound podcast, Global Pet Foods. So we're going to go over lines today. We're going to go over uh, some Twitter polls from the fans, uh, what you guys thought about uh, a couple of uh, players going into this season. We're going to talk about extensions, the, the cap situation, everything you're going to need to know for the Sabres as they open up tonight against the New York Rangers. So, Austin, let's start off with uh, the lines. And again, throughout the rookie tournament and the preseason, there was a lot of question marks on if Zach Benson was going to make this club uh, to open up the season. Well, I'm pretty sure that uh, those, I guess, rumors and questions have been answered because the Wenatchee Wild forward has made the club at least to start the year. Yeah, I mean, I think I think from a fan perspective, most people kind of penciled him into this nine game trial probably after the third preseason game when he was still practicing with Skinner and Thompson you know he looked good on pretty much Granado Saturday he looked good on every line that he was on but once you saw him late into the preseason still getting time with the top two guys I think it kind of became a reality that he was very at the very least going to get the nine games obviously there's still nothing set in stone but these next nine games will really show if he's truly NHL ready or if the preseason was the preseason but no matter what it's been a long time since the Sabres have really given a first round pick except for you know obviously the top overall guys but it's been a while since they've given a non-first overall pick that nine game trial so really interesting to see what Benson does with this and if it, the preseason is any indication no reason to doubt that he's going to look just fine yeah and taking over number nine which I'm sure a lot of Sabres fans will be changing that nameplate on those Eichel jerseys to Zach Benson uh, if they haven't already so let's look at the projected lines and again this is from Daily Faceoff in the time of recording this 
um, Wednesday night going into Thursday morning, uh, the morning of the first Sabres uh, regular season game. Jeff Skinner, Tage Thompson, Alex Tuck, to be expected, Austin, on the top line there. That was really, you know, the catalyst line for the team last year and, and makes sense putting them back together at least to start the year. Yeah, I mean, I think there was really no reason to to kind of mess around with that. I know near the end of the year they had middle stat uh, played up there when Tage kind of had some injury issues there, but those three are probably one of the most lethal offensive lines in the league. Uh, no reason to mess around with that. They have great chemistry. Thompson, Skinner, Tuck. Like, I think you can put anyone with any combination of those two players and they're going to succeed, but there's no doubting that that is the straw that stirs the Sabres drink when it comes to their offensive production. So there's no reason to not have that line together to start the year. Going into the second line, this is where it kind of gets interesting. Obviously, Jack Quinn's out with an injury, uh, at least till probably December around that area, give or take. So you've got J.J. Paterka on the left wing with Dylan Cousins and Victor Olofsson as the second line right wing, Austin. Do you do you expect this line to kind of shake up a little bit as the season goes on? I, yeah, I would expect it too, but we know that Paterka and Cousins have great chemistry together. They were part of that kid line last year with Quinn obviously being the one that we expected to slot in there, but Really going to depend on if Olsen can find that off- offensive spark again and if Paterka and Cousins can kind of take a step forward defensively, that line will have some pop. I mean, I like their their performance in a couple of their preseason games. I know Olsen had a couple of goals against the Penguins. Like It's hard because he's such a bad defensive liability. But if the other two can kind of counteract that and if Cousins, you know, you're paying Cousins a lot of money, Paterka, you're hoping he takes that second step. So as long as Olsen can kind of, just be replacement level defense, but continue to have that offensive prowess. Uh, that line should be okay. Uh, the good news is the way that the Sabres second and third line works, either one could probably be the second line. Yeah, it's to, to me, that's going to be interchangeable all year long. Uh, like, depending on if they end up going out and getting a guy like Patrick Kane, you know, those rumors are out there. Obviously, he's going to be out till at least December. But if, if Quinn comes back, maybe he sluts in the line. If Benson ends up doing well, you know, to start the year here, maybe he gets moved up. But most likely, I think the nine game trial is is where Benson's going to be at. But I think there's going to be a lot of changes to that second line, at least on, on the winger spot. Dylan Cousins, obviously, is going to be glued into that second line center role for most of the year unless an injury does happen, you know, barring to Tate Thompson. So. Uh, as we look at the third line, Austin, and those of you following along uh, on the video version, you can see it on the screen. Jordan Greenway, Casey Middlestat, and the aforementioned Zach Benson. What do you think of that third line? Obviously, Middlestat played a little bit of wing at the end of last year uh, on the second line, but uh, what do you think of putting him in that third line center spot to start the year? Yeah, so kind of like I said, how he went on that heater near the end of the year last year, that's when he was playing center. I know he was with Skinner and Tuck, but... He looks like he kind of found something and it clicked at that position. So I think pairing him with a really solid, he's a rookie, we haven't seen him play, but Benson's game is that solid offensive presence with that hard, high motor forechecking and defensive ability with Benson there. Greenway, I know it was a bit of a struggle for him, but I really do like what he brings. He's got that size. He's a nice, responsible defensive forward who does have some offensive touch. I think this could be a big year for him. I like that line. I mean, I know Benson's first preseason game, I believe he was with, Greenway and Jost, I don't remember exactly, but I know it wasn't Middlestat. And that line was really good. Middlestat's more offensively capable than Jost, obviously not as responsible defensively, but I do like the potential that that, that line has. And I think if the transition for Benson does go well and he does fit in, this is going to be a three nice top nine. Like, is it elite by all means? No, because it's kind of hard to expect, you know, Jordan Greenway to be an elite offensive producer. It's kind of hard to expect an 18 year old to be an elite offensive producer, but. If they click, that line has the potential to be very good offensively and not hurt the Sabres defensively, which when you have an 18-year-old rookie on that line, that's really all you're asking. And I have a question about that, but I'll get to that after we uh, wrap up the forward lines here. Zambis Gergensen's and Kyle Okpozo on the wings. Gergensen's again just continues to get those one or two year contracts to remain the the mo- the longest tenured Saber. I can't believe he's uh, he's lasted this long uh, for big uh, big Z or big Z in in, the, in in America. But uh, it's good to see hopefully you know him take a step and get into the playoffs with his team because he's been here through so much. Uh, over the last 12 years, so it would be nice to see uh, Zemgis, you know, finally get into the playoffs with this group as, you know, the last man standing kind of thing. And Peyton Krebs, obviously the uh, highly touted uh, forward from the Vegas Golden Knights that they acquired in the Jack Eichel trade. Starting on the fourth line center, Austin, what do you think about the, the potential of this line? And, you know, do you think that Krebs is 
they're probably trying to find a role for him right now, just given how how stacked the the top six is to kind of try to get him in the lineup, even on a fourth line role. Yeah, so this was the fourth line that the Sabres had for most of the year last year, and it just Krebs has really taken on that role. I think is a good thing. I don't think really many players that had his caliber coming into the league would be nearly as thrilled to be playing the role that he has kind of taken on since he joined the Sabres, but he's turned into that grinding, forechecking center who, you know, he is one of the Sabres' better forecheckers. He's really good along the boards below the goal line. I know a lot of people want more points from him. I am one of those people. That being said, can't really expect it from him when he's playing with Gergensen and Oposo, but this line will be responsible defensively. They'll work the puck down low. They'll cycle the puck. They'll wear the other opposing team out, and if they throw in a couple goals here and there, that's awesome. Like I, I do think Krebs probably, yes, this is not what you envisioned for him, but he's taken to it. He's accepted it, and he looks like he's become one of the heart and souls on this team. And having a four-line center like him who does have some offensive spark, Oposo, Jurgensen's not the most gifted scorers, but Oposo did, does have a great shot still. That does still exist with him, so you never know. Um, but in the meantime, if they're going to be a strong, all you want your four-line to be is respons- responsible defensively as long as they're that no issues at all yeah and like you said he could you know have an offensive spark here and there pot in a couple of points and maybe even move up the lineup barring any any sort of injuries you know in the top nine he could probably move up and be effective in that role uh gonna throw a hypothetical at you now austin let's say zach benson does go back to wenatchee after the nine game trial um whether he does or not you know we'll have to wait and see about that matt savoy when he comes back from his injury and when jack quinn does come back where do you think that the Sabres line combinations would kind of sort out with those two guys coming back. So in this hypothetical, Benson's down, right? Yeah. All right. Well, in that hypothetical, you'd probably give Savoy his nine games. And if he, same thing, if he sticks, he sticks. And then I would imagine Quinn would slot in where Olofsson is because Paterka Cousins and Quinn have that great chemistry. And then you would see Olofsson either be traded or him and Joe be rotating out because if Savoy makes the team, obviously he's shown enough, you're not going to want him out of the lineup. So I would imagine that Olofsson, I know it's not the greatest word, but he's basically a placeholder right now. Savoy is a bit of a wild card. I do think that, and this is not a knock on Savoy at all, I do think that if one of the two is going to stick, it's going to be Benson, just because he's had that full training camp. He hasn't had that injury. Um, Savoy was the best player come rookie camp before he got hurt. So I think there was a chance that he... If he doesn't get hurt, maybe we're talking about him having an excellent preseason and not not Benson, but Benson's made the most of his opportunity. He fits this lineup well. So if he's not here, I don't think Granado wants Olsen as a regular part of this lineup. He kind of proved it last year when they were pushing for the playoffs and he was scrapped in pretty much every important game. So I don't think, I, as bad as it is, without the Quinn injury, Olsen's probably not here. I think that might be the only reason that he's here. So I would imagine once everyone's healthy, unless he's playing lights out, He's probably out of line. And you mentioned him a bit earlier uh, with Tyson Jost, and, and it was kind of shocking to me that they brought him back. But, you know, do you think that he could carve out a role on this team, maybe as that extra forward to come in the lineup when injuries happen? Or, you know, with, with if, if Benson does stay and you've got Quinn uh, and Savoy coming back, you know, where, where does that leave Tyson Jost in all of this? It's hard because, same thing, I thought he carved out a really nice role here. I think he, he is that smart responsible to a center who does have some offensive ability. I really did like him. I thought, I think it's tough now that middle is a full-time center because in all reality, without middle status center, if he was still on the wing, one Benson's probably not here. Jose is probably a full-time player, but I think that conversation had to be had. He had to know this was a possibility before he signed and came back. It sucks because I do think he has the potential to be and the ability to be an everyday player. He pretty much was an everyday player for the most part when Buffalo claimed him off waiver. So I do kind of not feel for him because I think he knew what he signed up for, but if that's your 13th forward, you're probably pretty happy. I just don't think they felt comfortable throwing him on the Cousins Paterka line because as much as Olsen is a liability defensively, and I don't like him at five on five, he does have that boom or bust offensive potential that I don't think Jose has, which is probably why Jose is on the outside looking in. Yeah, and Jose is a guy that can play wing, play center, obviously a first-round pick from Colorado, so he's obviously got the ability you know, to, to be an NHL player or, you know, he wouldn't have went that high. So I think, it, like you mentioned, if he can carve out a fourth line role or, or move into the lineup when needed, I, I like the fact that he can do that on this team. Whether he wants to do that or not, maybe his option, he didn't have many options elsewhere to had to be a full-time player. Maybe he wanted to stay with the Sabres because he sees the potential in that as opposed to going to like a rebuilding team and having maybe a third line role. Like, do you think that might have played into it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it honestly might just be a similar situation that Hinnis Rosa was in, you know, two summers ago when the Sabres brought him back. And I think a little pe- everyone was a little bit confused that he came back and then was waived and ended up, you know, finding finding a home elsewhere. I don't know if that's the exact situation that Jost is going to find himself in, but right now he is on the outside looking in. I do think you'll probably see him get into the lineup relatively soon. Like, I, I thought he was really solid in the preseason. He is a... You know, he's not a special player by any means, but he's definitely an NHL caliber player. And I think just right now, it's Benson really forced their hand. I don't know what the plan would have been if Benson didn't make the team. Uh, I don't know if Jost would be, you know, in that lineup and then a guy like Rusek or Kulik or Rose and would have made it as a 13th forward. I just don't know. But Benson outperformed all these guys. And now this is obviously the best 12 that Granado thinks he has. And that's where we are. Yeah, that's where we are for day one of the NHL regular season, which I'm sure is going to change uh, as we move forward here uh, to the se- end of the season and, and on this show. So uh, we'll move on to the defensive side of things, Austin. Uh, maybe not as much discussion on this side as, as there were on the forward group. You know, the defensive pairings are pretty locked in at this point, at least to begin the year. Matias Samuelson and Rasmus Dahlin on the top pair. You know, not not very surprising whatsoever. Obviously, Darlene uh, got the huge contract extension, which we'll get into a little bit later. But Samuelson was really that, you know, defensive defenseman that paired well with Darlene for most of the year and, and was able to, you know, have make Rasmus so successful in having such a great offensive season that he had last year. Yeah, I think that uh, I know there was a little bit of experimentation by Granado in training camp and in the preseason. I think that. It was only two games, but it was pretty evident that Clifton and Darlene just didn't work together because I think Clifton's a little bit more aggressive offensively than we probably, most people who probably haven't watched him regularly would have known. Uh, so I think that's kind of why you're seeing the pairings that are there now. But yeah, Darlene and Samuelson, they, they work together. Samuelson lets Darlene be Darlene and he's responsible defensively. So no problems with that pair. They work good together. Uh, you talked about Darlene's extension. We'll get into that later, but very clearly someone who the Sabres believe in for very good reason. He had a great year last year offensively. I think injuries probably derailed what would have been a really excellent season by him, uh, even though he probably had an excellent season by normal standards anyway. But they have good chemistry together. They know each other. Samuelson's never going to try and you know force the issue offensively. Darlene will get creative. I think that's kind of, if you ask Sabres fans in the summer what they expected their top pair to be, probably that, that pair. Most likely. Uh, the second pair, Owen Power and Henry Yoki Haru. You know, obviously Owen Power, uh, the first overall pick from a few years ago. The Sabres really have a nice core there on the defensive side of things. Yoki Haru, you know, I was had some questions in the offseason if maybe they would have moved on from him just based off of some of the defensemen that they did acquire and, and maybe they wanted to, to pick up some more assets in, in that regard and maybe some teams would look at Yoki Haru as a potential, you know, trade piece that they'd like. But for now, he's on that line with Owen Power. Do you like that second D pair? I think I'm going to have to just see how it plays out. I do, obviously, you, you love Owen Power, and I do like Yoki Haru as himself. Like, he does have value. It's a big year for him. Last year, of his three-year extension that he signed – we think of him as more of an offensive guy. Uh, I think this pair is going to be interesting because if Power is going to have the same freedom that Darlene has, Yoki Haru is going to have to have a little bit more focus on the defensive side. I think he has the ability to do it, but I think in my perfect world, he probably would have been down on the third pair. I just don't think they want to force Eric Johnson's hand at playing top four minutes regularly. But I think in theory, this this pairing could be really interesting because you have two good Puck moving defenseman, power is going to be super aggressive. Yoki Haru, I think there was obviously some ups and downs, but I did like his game in the preseason a lot. I think he's probably feeling, I think, uh, you know, he's not dealing with any nagging injuries. We know he got hurt early in the year last year. So it's a big year for him. And I, I think what better way to to have a great year than being strapped to the rocket ship that is Owen Power? Because that, that could be, re- if that pairing clicks, that's going to be really big for the Sabres. And I have seen, you know, in the preseason, the the coaching staff has been pleased with Yoki Haru's work in the defensive zone. Seems like they they've really wanted him to work on that uh, going into into this season. And I think, like you mentioned, he's going to have to do that more if he wants to stay in this top four role with this team. Because when you have Rasmus Dahlin and Owen Power, you know, Henry Yoki Haru is really not going to be an offensive catalyst on this team. Yeah, and you know, I, I think he's going to be smart. He's going to take his chances when they come to him. But you just don't want the aggressive mindset of two defensemen trying to force the issue offensively because then you kind of run into those issues of you're going to have a lot of odd man rushes against them. The Sabres were already a really bad team last year at giving up odd man rushes against. So that's an area that needs to be improved. And as long as Yoki Haru buys into – and power, because obviously power can't just neglect the defensive side of the, of the right. thing. It's going to take – communication is going to be key. So as long as 
they know when to pick their spots and they know when to activate and the other one knows to stay back. I think that pairing has got good potential. Those are two really young guys and never discount the fact that Yoki Hari is in a contract year because, you know, we've seen guys like Drew Stafford have massive years in the passing contract years. Hopefully Yoki Hari has a contract year bump and ups his value where Buffalo can either is forced to pay him or somebody else cashes in and gives a big payday because he's playing for his, not only his Sabres future, but, his next his next job yeah the well said there and we'll see contract years are always funny for for any player uh in in the national hockey league so we'll uh quickly talk about the third pair connor clifton obviously uh acquired in the offseason from the boston bruins and free agency and eric johnson as well a free agent signing from that great colorado avalanche team uh, that he's been with for so long won a stanley cup with them and was really you know a leader in that locker room and, and wanted to come to buffalo you saw that in his uh, interviews here you know he had other options but he really was excited about coming to buffalo let's start off with with johnson like does that excite you, the fact that a guy like that, I mean, I know he's at the tail end of his career, but you know that a guy like that, after leaving Colorado, you know, a, a powerhouse team, to come to Buffalo, I don't think that's a decision that you can look at around the league and, and just say that that was a coincidence. I think that, you know, the, the I guess the uh, the aura of what the Sabres are building here is something that is seen from even players coming from those top-end teams. Yeah, no, for sure, obviously, you you. You want to hear that a, 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 an accomplished player like Johnson wants to come here, and I know he's at the tail end of his career. Uh, I think he's still got some game left. I he only played the one preseason game. I thought he looked relatively uh, strong. He's not going to be forced to play a ton. He's going to play mostly five on five, maybe some penalty kill. Um, but he's going to play his game. He's going to be that stay at home guy. They're not really going to ask him to to push the pace or be you know like anything special back there, which is good. It's what you want to hear from him, and then him just you know being that mentor around these guys is is going to be a good thing and. We'll get into Clifton in, in, a, in a minute here, I'm guessing, but I actually do think there's some strong potential in that pair, especially the third pair. Yeah, and, and I was going to ask about Clifton's contract. I mean, they signed him to that three-year deal yeah. for 3.3. 3. Again, oh, maybe yeah. a little rich for a bottom six, a bottom pair defenseman, but then you look at what you know the Red Wings gave Justin Hull, and I don't know what they're doing with that. Good luck to that over there. But um, when you look at Connor Clifton, like, do you like that contract, even though it might be a little rich on, on the front end? Do you like what he adds to the lineup coming over from, obviously, a team that the Sabres are very familiar from with a division rival in Boston? Yeah, honestly, I, I have I have no issues with that contract whatsoever because, let's face it, we do know the way that Granado moves his deep pair around. Like, if the Sabres are chasing a lead, the top pair is going to be Power and Darlene. They're going to play a ton, so you'll probably see Clifton go from that. If the Sabres are losing, they're probably going to, he's probably going to go from you know third pair to second pair. He's probably going to play with Yoki Haru. They're probably not going to want Samuelson and Eric Johnson out there if they're trying to score a goal. Uh, on the flip side, Clifton also does have a nice defensive game. He likes to play with Jam. He likes that, so you'll see him probably on the penalty kill maybe. You'll see him... Granado has that relationship with him from the past. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's also out there trying to defend a lead. Uh, you know, three three point three three sounds like a lot for a third pair defenseman, but the way that the league's going now in the days, it's probably just the going rate because even Johnson's in the threes, right? So both your bottom pair defensemen are, are making the threes. Uh, Clifton will probably go up and down the lineup as the year kind of progresses. We know how much Granado loves to adjust mid game, so I have no issue with that contract at all, and I think he's going to fit well. Bernardo struck gold with guys he's had a previous relationship before. Uh, so he's kind of earned that level of trust. So I, I, I got to give him the benefit of the doubt here. And who would be your dark horse as probably may, as maybe the seventh D or first call up from Rochester? You know, somebody that you might look at it as if, if there were be somebody to go down there, who would you want to slide in there? I know Jacob Bryson's on the roster. Uh, I, I would have to probably say it depends on who goes down. Uh, because if a guy like, Samuelson or Johnson goes down. I, I probably like Riley Stillman getting called. I was a little bit shocked that Bryson made the team over him. Um, but they're going to give Bryson that benefit of the doubt. And I think it, if you're looking for call-offs, it, it's got to be Stillman or Ryan Johnson. I don't really think, you know, Kale Clegg is a fine in-between NHLer. Um, Bryson, same thing. He's a fine seventh defenseman. But if you're going to call somebody up and slot him in, Stillman fit well here last year. Um, Ryan Johnson's one of their – you know, he's a first round pick. He's been in Minnesota forever. Uh, he's now ready to make his first pro season. I thought he was strong in the preseason. So I think those would be the top two. Uh, Granado talked highly of Bryson. So I wouldn't be surprised if someone does get hurt. Bryson gets the first crack at the lineup after they recall somebody just because the way Granado talked about him, it seems that Bryson forced their hand and made his 
like he forced his way onto the team. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets the shot, but I think it's gotta be Stillman or Johnson. I don't really see anybody else down there right now being a legitimate shot in a full time NHL. Yeah, those would have been my options too. But uh, I, I think, like you mentioned, Bryson will probably get the first crack, barring like a, a huge injury to like Darlene or Power or somebody like that. If it's a, a bottom pair guy, I think Bryson gets the shot. But as you mentioned, Ryan Johnson uh, would be a guy to look at as well. Obviously, you know, a highly touted player, and I feel like he's been on this team forever. You know, he hasn't even played a game yet. But uh, well, quickly before we hit the break, we'll talk about the power play unit real quick. Uh, the first p- unit. Talk Cousins, Skinner up front with Tage and Darlene on the back end. What do you think about uh, having the four forwards there? Obviously, Tage is the trigger man uh, for for the most part, but uh, what do you think of of that kind of first unit, and do you think that that sticks for the whole season? Yeah, I mean, it was the first unit last year. It's going to be the first unit this year. I think that talent-wise is great um, uh, for people who, if they didn't get to see any of the preseason hockey, because I know some of the games either weren't on TV or weren't being broadcast at all, but um, the power play looked a little bit different. Uh, the players were essentially the same, but obviously preseason, they never really had their full lineup, but they really started utilizing that bumper position, uh, which I think is going to be key because now teams can't just key on Tage's one-timer, which I know no matter what, if he is, if, if he gets the one-timer off, it doesn't matter who's in the lane, there's a shot that's going in, but just adding that extra threat of the bumper position there will kind of add a little bit of flair there because this power play was not as good as it could have been last year. Let's face it, special teams kind of sucked last year for Buffalo. The power play has too much talent to not be good. So if that little tweak is what unlocks this, that'll be great. But yeah, it, that, that's going to be the top unit all year. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah, pretty self-explanatory there. The second unit is where it gets interesting for me. You got Greenway, Middlestad, and Zach Benson right now up front with Owen Power and Victor Olofsson. Again, this, as we've mentioned, you know, Olofsson's five-on-five game is not where he makes his his bread and butter. It's really on the power play. Uh, that's, you know, where he gets most of his points are with power play goals or, or power play points. So what do you think about him being on that D pair on the second power play unit? And do you think that there's a chance that Jordan Greenway is kind of like that net front presence, you know, just put him there because he's, he's a big body and can kind of, you know, get a couple of rebounds in for that second unit. Yeah. I think Olsen has to be on that unit. Let's face it. Who else? Jack Quinn's out. So no one else really has a shot that rivals Olsen or even comes close. I think Quinn would be the next closest or Cooley who's down in Rochester, but obviously he didn't make the team. So that makes sense. Greenway, Good net front presence, big body. He's good and he's good and tight. I also think he's more a bit of an underrated passer. So if they get like watch for him, if, it's a second unit, so they're probably going to be out there what forty five seconds uh-huh. on the power play tops. They they won't get the first shift, but watch for Greenway if he gets the puck below the goal line. He, he's a pretty underrated passer. He's got solid vision, so he might be able to work the puck from down there. But I think same thing. It's going to be if the Olsen one timers working, that second unit's going to be lethal. If not, it's going to be power pretty much working with Benson up top and hopefully middle and Greenway can, you know, use their shots and their bodies to get some positions because if Olsen's like you said, you just said it, if he's not, if he's not effective on the power play, I don't, he's not really effective. So if his one timer's not working, that second unit probably won't get, a, get as many opportunities as you would like them to. No. And, and power last, last point on him, you know, would you like to see him stay on that second unit? Do you think there's any way that he kind of elevates to that first unit? I know you've got Darlene on there already and, and, you know, you don't want to overload it there, but is there any way that he kind of, you know, increases his offensive output on the power play uh, with a chance on the first unit? Or do you think that, you know, spreading it out with the second unit is probably where they're going to go with him all year? I would have, like, I would have to say, keep him on the second unit. I know it's not, the same at all, but I watched Pittsburgh's power play with Carlson and Latang, and it just looks it looks chaotic. It looks like you have two elite defensemen who want to move the puck. It looks like they don't want to be selfish. They're pressing the issue. They're trying. I, I, I think just let power run the second unit. If anything, if the first unit's not going, give the second unit more time because you have a capable guy like power who can run that power play and will be – Maybe in his second year, not as effective as Darlene, but has all the potential in the world to run a power play just as effectively. Doesn't have the shot that Darlene has, but he has the, the smarts and the vision and the passing ability. So keep them separated. Have that two effective unit uh, go in there. And let's let's be honest, you want your first unit to be the, the one clicking and scoring all the goals. So if your second unit's out there, first unit didn't do their job. So as long as power is still out on the ice, I don't know if his point production is going to go up. If his point production is going to go up, it's probably going to be from his five on five play, but let him run that second unit because I have all the faith in the world that he can quarterback that unit and doesn't need to be thrown up on that top. 
I agree. So that's basically the rundown for the line. So we're going to take a break on our show. We're going to come back. We're going to get to the Twitter polls, some news, uh, and, and wrap up uh, our season preview show. So stay right here. Be right back on Saber Semantics, brought to you by JNO Flooring, as always, as a part of the Armchair GM Sports Network. JNL Flooring is Niagara's specialty flooring and design company. They take great pride and provide elite customer service and support. With a beautiful showroom, great pricing, and a wide variety of truly unique products, JNL Flooring is your specialty flooring and decor boutique shop. All of their products are environmentally friendly and responsibly produced so you can feel good about your flooring choices. Their goal is to build authentic relationships based on honesty and integrity that they foster with respect and authenticity. Offering a unique and wide range of quality products presented by a knowledgeable and patient team, they simplify the process to make your life easier and to make your home more beautiful. Visit them at 4424 Montrose Road in Niagara Falls or find out more at jnlflooring.com. If you think you can get a better deal anywhere else, you don't know Jack at JNL Flooring. Niagara Golf Lounge features two state-of-the-art indoor golf simulators allowing you to play some of the world's best courses all year round. The perfect place to indulge all season long. Don't worry about getting thirsty while you play around with your friends. Their fully stocked bar offers a wide selection of drinks, appetizers, and a variety of meals are also available to enjoy before, during, or after you play. Grab a seat next to the fire in their comfortable sports lounge. Didn't bring your clubs? No problem. They have partnered with TaylorMade to offer you the best rental clubs. You won't want to miss their exclusive NFL and NHL giveaways for the Buffalo Sabres and Buffalo Bills. Located in the Best Western Plus Cairncroft Hotel, 6400 Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls. Visit NiagaraGolfVacations.com to learn more and to reserve your golf bay today. The Niagara Golf Lounge, Niagara's home for golf and sport all year round. In the Niagara region, Global Pet Foods is your destination for premium pet nutrition and caring expertise. Whether you've welcomed a new furry family member or need advice on top quality nutrition, their dedicated staff is ready to help. Discover why Global Pet Foods' lesser-known premium brands outshine the big corporate names. Their team's passion ensures your pet's health and vitality. Check out one of their locations today, 3643 Portage Road in Niagara Falls, 160 Highway 20 in Font Hill, or 400 Scott Street and 344 Glendale Avenue in St. Catharines. Global Pet Foods, where premium brands and caring staff make the difference. Since 1999, Niagara Dental Clinic has been helping thousands of patients achieve natural-looking smiles with the confidence to show them off. Sean Battelle and his wife Anne, both licensed denturists, bring a wealth of skill and experience to the warm and friendly atmosphere to their Niagara Falls location at 5501 Drummond Road. And their on-site Niagara Hearing Clinic offers free hearing tests and a variety of services to fit your needs. This family-run practice takes pride in providing superior care and service to their patients, along with the best premium products available on the market. Get the best work done at a more reasonable price. Niagara Dental Clinic is here to help. Protect your teeth with a mouth guard, replace missing teeth, and get better hold with your dental implants. Call them today for a free consultation at 905-353-1552 or check them out online at NiagaraDentureClinic.com. Niagara Dental Clinic. Creating natural smiles in the Niagara region for 25 years. You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network, the Niagara region's best local source for North American sports podcasting coverage. By sports fans, for sports fans. Welcome back to part two of our Saber Semantics show right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network brought to you by JNO Flooring. 
If you think you can get a better deal anywhere else, you don't know Jack. Contact their Niagara Falls location to begin your next quality flooring project today. The Proud Show sponsor of Saber Semantics, and Jack's a big Sabres fan, so I know he's excited about uh, us getting going with our Sabres content here on the network. Guys, make sure if you're watching on the YouTube version, make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, smash that bell for all updates on video versions of our podcast to get released here on the network. And thank you for those listening in on-demand audio on all of our different audio platforms. Make sure to follow the podcast on X at Saber Semantics for all updates on our shows there. Brandon Caputo and Austin Broad back with you. And Austin, let's uh, let's touch on the, uh, the Darlene extension real quick. Uh, from NHL.com, and I'm trying to read it because I made it really small, and this is a, a bad mistake on my part. Um, but basically says, you know, I grew up, I, I grew up here as a man. Um, I came here as a, as an 18 year old, didn't know much about uh, anything, and learned the language. You know, learned everything. I'm beginning. I love the city. I've always, you know, been been here uh, for a long time, and I want to be here, you know, into the into the long run. And and basically, Kevin Adams echoes what he means to the team and how he's only going to be 32 years old when the contract is up and probably be able to get another solid contract here in the National Hockey League but again first overall pick the Sabres won that lottery that year got Rasmus Dahlin things were kind of rough there in the Ralph Kruger era as as you've uh, you know been a vocal about over the past that you know Dahlin's career was almost you know derailed from from Ralph Kruger for those few years but uh, well deserved for Rasmus Dahlin and, you know, some people can say that the cap hits high, but I think when you look back at it, maybe in four or five years, depending on how, how high the cap goes up within the next few years, 11 million for Rasmus Dahlin as a top defenseman in the NHL won't look that bad. No, I mean, let's be honest. He's the second highest paid defenseman in the NHL right now behind only Eric Carlson. Um, so it is a little bit high right now, but like you just said, with the way the cap's going to go up, we're going to be looking at that contract in four or five years. I don't know if it'll ever be a steal when you're paying a defenseman $11 million, but if it looks like a fair deal and he's an $11 million player, you have nothing to complain about because he lived up to his potential. So good thing that they got it done for eight years. Um, I know there was some talk out there that with the way Austin Matthews and the new trend was going, that UF RFAs were going to be signing, you know, shorter term deals to kind of maximize their long-term uh, earnings. So I'm glad they got it done for eight years because let's be honest, the most, if you get him for eight years, you're always happy. Uh, no problems with the contract at all. Like I said, if anyone says it's a little steep right now, yeah, of course it is. He's the second highest paid defenseman in the NHL right now. Uh, but in the future, it's going to look a lot better when you already have guys like Thompson and Cousins on long-term deals making under $8 million. It gives you that flexibility to give Darlene maybe a little bit more than, than you wanted to at first. But all in all, I thought it was going to be around the 10.5 range. But at the end of the day, $500,000 extra year not not that no to lock up your franchise defenseman i mean I, I don't have a problem with it if you have one guy making 11 million i'm okay with it i mean look at what the leafs are doing with with their three guys it's it's a nightmare right now but when you have thompson and cousins your top two centers on long-term deals you know making less than eight eight million dollars i mean that's breaking news what Owen Power has signed a seven-year contract with an AAV of $8.35 million per year. Okay, so that's breaking news here on the show. So uh, the Owen Power contract, Austin, you want to, uh, <laughs> I guess we'll kind of pivot to that real quick. What was the AAV again? Uh, 8.35. Okay, so there you go. You've locked up, you know, it's perfect timing for us talking about it. You've locked up Darlene Samuelson and Owen Power on your defensive side of things for a long time, uh, Austin, I think. Again, when you're Kevin Adams and Don Granado, long-term play here, you know, a competitive playoff team in a few years, when you've got all these pieces locked up in your core, I mean, you're really, you know, thinking that you're going to be going for it for a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, like, sorry, I'm just trying to process everything right now. Uh, <laughs> seven years, aside from Darlene getting the eight, seven years has kind of been Adams' MO. We see that with Thompson, Cousins, they all got seven-year deals. Even Samuelson got his seven-year deal. I think the 8.35, I think, look, I don't, I think Ottawa fans have become my least favorite people on earth. I think I don't like them more than <laughs> now. But when Sanders signed his deal, I know it was eight years for eight mil. Uh, I think once that deal was announced and Power was still unsigned, there was no chance that Power was going to sign for less than Sanderson. So he's in that same ballpark for a, a year less. But at the end of the day, he'll be 27, 28 when that contract's up. Have another shot at signing him to another one if you want. 
but you just said it there. Samuelson, Power, Dahlien locked up for seven, eight years each, along with Thompson and Cousins on the front end. You're golden. Yeah, you can't uh, can't ask for more than that uh, for the Sabers core there. Um, what do you think of their cap situation just in general? Like, are you happy with with the amount of cap space that they've left themselves? Some flexibility if they want to make a move for a guy like Patrick Kane or, or what have you, and just having that flexibility because we've seen guys in the league with like or teams in the league like Vegas and Toronto. Tampa Bay they've just been in in a nightmare situation with these players just or these you know being over the cap and having to force guys to go on long-term IR and just all that mess so are you okay with them having that flexibility yeah of course you're okay with them having that flexibility I I think the good thing for the Sabres is the way that they've stocked their organization they're gonna have a lot of good players on ELCs in the next two let's say two years because I think if Benson and Savoy don't make the team this year, they slide for a year. Kulich and Rosen, I still think, have one more slide year before those deals automatically kick in. So you're locking up these big players to long-term deals at reasonable cap hits. I think Dahlien aside, let's, 11 mil is a good – it's not a terrible cap hit at all, but it's a big cap hit. So when you lock up the other guys for 8 and 7 and 7, like we said, and then you're hoping that Benson, Kulich, Rosen, Savoy, maybe not, not all at the exact same time because – I don't think any organization will get that lucky. But if two of those guys end up being effective on their ELCs, it gives you that cap hit. You're going to see um, Skinner's contract come off in a couple of years. I know we talked about that, but that contract doesn't even look that bad anymore. I think Adams has done a great job. And I know the 8.35 for power might be a little bit richer than we thought. I like what Adams has done. He said he wanted to lock up these guys long term, and he did it. You and I, I don't know if we talked about it on our previous podcast, but we had before, but Adams has pretty much done everything he said he's going to do. And the beautiful part is no one reports it until it's done. The Sabres report everything. So they have tap space to be flexible. I don't know what your thoughts are. We can probably save it for a different show. I don't know if we want to talk about the season preview because it's not done. Your thoughts on the Patrick Kane situation are. But if that's a move that they want to explore, he has set himself up to do that. So I think Adams has earned a lot of benefit of the doubt here. He's identified his core. He's locked it up. Is it going to work? It remains to be seen. That's seven, eight years from the future now. But... No one can say that he hasn't stuck to his plan. No, absolutely not. And we'll save the Patrick Kane stuff for for another day. I'm sure we'll need some stuff to talk about and you know hypotheticals yeah. and get into rumors and things like that. Uh, we'll save that. But it is a it is an option for the Sabers, you know, to be able to make a move like that that maybe some other teams wouldn't be able to do uh, given their current cap situation. So we'll kind of see how that monitors out as he gets closer to to being able to play hockey. So. Uh, we'll we'll end off today with the Twitter polls, and that's going to be brought to you by the Niagara Employment Help Center, helping people find work in Niagara since 1983. Check out their up-to-date job board at ehc.on.ca to find your next work opportunity today. Uh, put the Twitter polls up today uh, on at Saber Semantics. Make sure you're following that uh, for any more polls that we put up for our shows this year. Uh, first poll, Austin. Well, uh, this one was pretty pretty easy slam dunk here, but I put it in there anyway. Which player do you expect to lead the Sabers in points this season? Rasmus Dahlin, Tage Thompson, Dylan Cousins, and Alex Tuck. Obviously, Tage Thompson was the winner by a landslide. I was kind of shocked that Rasmus Dahlin got 0% of the vote, though. Honestly, like maybe Tuck would have got a little bit more love there because we're talking about total points, right? So Yeah. Yeah, Darlene gets 0% is a little bit surprising. I mean, he's not going to put up 100 points like Carl. I mean, he has the potential to, so I guess that's that's that there. But yeah, no, I think I think I would have expected Tage to win that. But if you would have, someone would have told me that Darlene was up there or even Tuck was up there, I wouldn't have been shocked. But I think, let's be honest, Tage is probably the guy that most people would, would have voted for just because he has the flash. He's got the potential. Like, he's got the, the boomer bust. He's so much fun to watch, but... Yeah, I mean, Dolly getting zero percent that is a little puzzling. Yeah, that was that was a little bit shocking to me, considering how great of a season that he had last year. Uh, you know, with uh, w- with his point total, and, and I just I, I think he'll be up there for defensive points at least around the league. I think he he could easily finish top three for defensive points within the league. Obviously, McCarr, if he's healthy, is going to be up there as well. I don't know if Eric Carlson's going to have the year like he had last year, but I would I expect Dolly to be up there for sure. Yeah, I think Darlene will be up there. Uh, he would have. He was on pace to be up there before. You know, he had that that injury slowed him down. I think a little bit more than people wanted to admit. <clears throat> yeah, imagine Carlson puts up 100 points again. Um, he's on Pittsburgh now. He's not going to be able to be. Let's be honest. He's on San Jose. They were never going anywhere, so he could play feeling and not have to worry about consequences. He can still play that style, but Pittsburgh's trying to make the playoffs here with Kyle Dubas, so consequences aren't going to matter for him. <laughs> Carlson's fantastic offensive defenseman. 
he's going to put up a ton of points. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to avoid homerism here, but if you told me Dahlin is up there with Makar and Carlson, wouldn't be shocked at all. No, I wouldn't either. And trust me, I, I, as a, somebody that's a Shark supporter too, I watched Eric Carlson, and yeah, that team was not fun to watch at all. Um, yeah, so Darlene had 73 points in 78 games. So I think if he stays on a healthy 82-game season, if he's up around 85, 90, I think that's best-case scenario for Rasmus Darlene right now. Um, we'll move on to the next poll here. I'll go to a uh, step-forward poll, which of these Sabres players takes the biggest step this season. J.J. Paterka, Owen Power, Casey Middlestat, Matias Samuelson. Um, J.J. Paterka comes away with the 64.3%. Owen Power at 357 The other two had goose eggs. So uh, thoughts on Paterka winning that? Yeah, I think he's the one that people, if you had to identify one, he would be the one that's poised for the breakout year. Uh, I think Owen Power is a little bit underrated because he just doesn't have like the, the production numbers. But stats to me don't matter for a defenseman. Power is kind of already trending towards a star. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up being the biggest breakout guy this year because his numbers might look a little bit better. But to me, he's already legit. Uh, Paterka, I, I think, especially, it, again, it sucks because I love Jack Quinn and I want the three of them being together. But without Jack Quinn, a little bit more falls on Paterka's plate. Uh, you're now, aside from Benson, you're the the youngest forward. Like you, you are the, the, the one who... We had so many guys have career years last year. Um, can't expect all of them to have career years again. You need someone to step up. And I think given the opportunity and the playing time and just the skill set, Paterka is the greatest option for that. And if he does, if he does have a nice, you know, little breakout year where he's in the 60-point the range, I think that's going to be huge for Buffalo. So I have no issues with Paterka winning that poll. He's the guy that I'm expecting to have the biggest breakout year. And I think he kind of needs to if Buffalo wants to get to that next a little bit, you know, I, I guess the only other person who wasn't on the poll, you could maybe say Levi, because he's kind of being forced into a starting goalie role. It's kind of unprecedented for someone like that to have a really strong rookie year. But hey, the Sabres have had it happen before with Barrasso, went straight from, you know, to skip the stage and won a Vesna. I'm not saying Levi's going to do that, but uh, he would be the only other one that I would talk about there, even though he wasn't on the poll, because if the Sabres make the playoffs this year, Levi is probably going to have a massive say in that because I think with better goal pending last year, they're a playoff team and the same questions are there this year. Yeah, and we'll, we'll segue into the goalie poll here, which goaltender starts the most games for them this season. Not not shocked at all. Devin Levi, 71.4%, 21.4% for Eric Comrie, and 71 for Uko Pekalukkanen. We didn't touch that on that in the lines, Austin. Uh, they're running with the three goalies to at least start the year. You know, do you expect that to last, or do you think that either one of them gets moved, or they try to put one of them on waivers to try to sneak through? Yeah, no. So I think we saw that as a trend in the NHL this year. Um, I think it was something five, five, five or six. I don't know the exact number, but they all went with three goalies. I think it's mostly because there were a few teams that you know lost their starting goalie for the long term or had some question marks there. So some teams snuck the three goalies onto their roster to kind of see how things play out. You know, our old friend, you know, Hansen is the starting goalie for the Tampa Bay. I think it's pretty safe to assume that if Lukanen or even Comrie, uh, one of them was waived, I, I think it's safe to assume one of them got claimed. I mean, we saw the goalies always get claimed. So I think that's why teams, if they had three decent goalies and one needed waivers, you saw them trend towards keeping three goalies just until some stuff gets figured out. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, until he proves he can't handle it, they're going to ride Devin Levi. Uh, preseason wise doesn't mean much, but I thought Eric Tomry was very strong. I think he earned the right to be the primary backup. So we'll see how long the three goalie experiment lasts for, because there is no Craig Anderson this year. There is no goalie who can only play once a week. These are three young, like Tomry is 29, but he's young in terms of NHL experience. These are three young goalies who can all play every night. Um, Granado, it's going to be tough. Like if, if Levi is your starter, and, you know, you throw in the backup and he has a bad game and you rotate to the next backup. Like, we're talking about a potential where one of the guys is sitting for a couple of weeks and that's not a good recipe for disaster. So with three goalies who are capable of playing every night, I'm very, very interested to see how he handles it. And I'm very interested to see how long it lasts because I don't – it's not something that is normal in the NHL. And there's a there's got to be a reason that it's not normal because I don't think it'll work, but – we're here now. That's what you have to deal with for at least the, the, the interim. Um, a little bit surprised, honestly, 
there was no move made, whether it be Lukanen out or I don't think anyone was going to trade for Comrie in the summer, but I always thought maybe they would explore the Lukanen market, but they didn't. So they're giving him another chance to try and stick around here. Feels like he's had a ton of chances and that he's just never run with it. So we'll see. Yeah, they're going to, you know, see which one of them emerges uh, from that point. But again, I just, I don't, I don't like a third goalie just never playing. I think you want to get him down in the AHL playing games, but if they all have to go through waivers, then you're kind of stuck. So uh, we'll see how that kind of goes. We'll monitor it in the first couple weeks of the season, see if they do make a move there. Uh, first year Sabres poll. So again, this is for a uh, Sabres player playing their first year with the organization on a full-time basis. Uh, which one will make the biggest impact? Eric Johnson, Connor Clifton, Zach Benson, and Matt Savoy. Obviously, you know, Benson will remain to be seen if he's going to last after the nine games. But regardless, uh, Eric Johnson takes this one 42.9, Zach Benson 35.7, and Connor Clifton 21.4. I think Connor Clifton's will be a little bit slept on. I know he didn't have two great performances in the preseason, but I think he's a little bit, you know, a little bit underrated. I think he's going to play again. I don't know what we'll see what the penalty kill role and stuff is right now. They're both on the third pair. I do love Johnson's veteran leadership. I love Eric Johnson. He's a guy that I think I think a lot of people said he makes perfect sense for the Sabres because they need a veteran on defense. But I just think in terms of his on ice play, Clifton's got the higher potential. And the other two, like you just said, we don't know if Savoy and Benson are going to be here full time. So I, I have to lean with Clifton on that one personally. Wow. Okay. So the fans went with Eric Johnson and, and you're with uh, Connor Clifton on that one. So we'll see how that, uh, that court sort of goes. Final poll for today's show, which bottom six player will make the biggest impact for the Sabres this season? Jordan Greenway, Tyson Jost, Kyle Pozo, Zemgus Gergensons. I really could have put Peyton Krebs on this poll too, but um, I actually don't know why I left Peyton Krebs off this poll when I think about it. But regardless, Jordan Greenway takes it away at 64.3%. Jost is second with 21.4%. Uh, interesting considering he's not in the opening night lineup, at least as of now. And then uh, Akpozo and Gergens is at 7.1%. So what do you think of that? Oh, God, it's it's Jordan Greenway. It's less, unless, like, again, he's not here full season. We don't know yet. Greenway or Benson? Because if, if Greenway is here and he's playing well and he has a big impact, like I talked about in the first segment, it makes the top three lines that much better. And if Greenway, he's got the potential. If he has a strong season, not only does that trade look a lot better, you have him signed for another year after this. Um, now all of a sudden you can throw him out there in multiple situations and know that he's going to have a positive impact. So to me, it's he's going to have the biggest impact because he has the highest potential, but also because he has to have the highest impact. Because if Jordan Greenway is not an effective player, you essentially have... I mean, maybe Krebs can flip up to the wing there, but that's something you probably don't want to get into. So if Greenway isn't the most effective bottom six, or yeah, bottom six player, something's gone horribly wrong. They need him to step up in, in a big way. And honestly, I might be one of the very few people that do believe in him, but I still believe in him. I like his skill set. I like what he can bring to the table. It's just he's had a full off season now to train for Granado's system. He's had the preseason underway. I think you might see, I don't know what a breakout year looks for Greenway. Um, not expecting him to be you know, a high end point producer, but I am expecting him to have a strong year, both offensively and defensively. Yeah. And if he can pot in maybe five or 10 goals on that second power play, and I think that's like a best case scenario, you know, if you, and then add in some goals, five on five, but you know, if you're putting him in front of the net on the second power play unit, there's probably something there to be desired that, you know, there is potential for him to, to knock in a few extra goals this year with the man advantage. But, um, so Austin, we we've discussed it all show, basically gone through the lines, gone through, you know, what the, what the lineup looks like, the cap situation, uh, what players we expect to kind of take a big step. You know, what are your realistic expectations for this team? Obviously, they missed out on the playoffs by one point plus a tiebreaker, considering they had a nine game losing streak. You know, given what the Atlantic division looks like this year, do you think that it's a possibility for them to sneak into a wild card spot, or are you an optimist that they could have a top three spot in the Atlantic? I think best case scenario is number three in the Atlantic. I think the most realistic scenario is, and you know, there's nothing wrong with me saying this, people might jump on me, is a playoff bubble team. And I think that's what the Sabres are. They're a playoff bubble team. I think if the goaltending is strong, they'll make the playoffs. If it's inconsistent again, you're probably going to miss. Um, but this team has all the potential in the world. Uh, the division is a little bit more up for grabs. I do think Boston takes a step back, but they were one of they were historically the greatest team in the NHL all <laughs> of all time. So even a step back for them is probably still a really solid team. Um, they have a good defense, good goaltending. Tampa Bay is still Tampa Bay. Um, without Vasilevsky for eight to ten weeks hurts. It does hurt. Uh, if Jonas Johansson is the Jonas Johansson that you and I know, they're in trouble. But their offense is so high-powered, kind of like the Sabres, that they can probably just outscore you. 
Um, you know, as much as you and I don't like them, Toronto is still good. Florida, they have some injuries to the start of the year. Uh, can they recover from that one? One's healthy. I don't know. Uh, that's why I think a three seed is the best case scenario. But I think the more realistic one is this team is a bubble wild card team. But I don't know if it's my fan expectation. Um, I think they are a wild card team. I think they do get in. But the goaltending is the only question that I have, and that's the, I think anyone with a brain kind of feels the same way. That's the only thing that's stopping this team from being in the playoffs is is that goaltending going to be consistent this year? Yeah, it's almost like Devin Levi is going to be the X factor for this team, whether they sink or swim. Um, you know, and, and it's it's going to be interesting whether they do make the playoffs or not. But regardless, can I just say that they're a fun team to watch? I mean, when you oh. have Zach Benson, this is a fun team that, you know, we've been waiting 12 years for a team that, you know, you can look at and say this is a fun team to watch. And I think this, this you know, crop of Sabres talent that they have, even when they lose games, for the most part, it, it's it's a fun team that, uh, you know, is easy on the eyeballs. Yeah, they they were a fun team last year. Um, they're a fun team this year. Um, with some of the, the, the lineup changes, you know, with Anderson retiring, Benson making the opening day lineup, they're actually the youngest opening day lineup in the NHL right now. So that bodes well for them. Like I said, it's it's. I know because they missed by one point last year. I also expect playoffs this year. But I think realistically, when you kind of take a step back, it's okay to admit that they probably are a playoff bubble team. And that's fine because a playoff bubble team is in it till the very end like they were last year. But now there's expectations. It's hard to envision, you know, Tuck, Cousins, Thompson, Skinner all had careers last year. You can't mm-hmm. expect them to have career years every year. So there's probably going to be a little bit of regression offensively, but that's why I said if a guy like Paterka can step up, if Greenway can have a solid year. If the gold timing gets better, it'll make up for that slight you know, regression to the mean that people always talk about. This team's still fun, like you just said. They're still going to be really good. They're still going to score a ton of goals, and they're still going to be in it right till the end unless something goes horribly wrong. So enjoy it. We'll talk more throughout the year. If there's any bridges to, if there's any cliffs that we need to talk each other down from, we'll be able to do that. It's going to be a fun year. I think it's the first year in a long time. Like we've talked, we've all, there's been optimism a lot, let's face it. And it's always been blown up in our face. But I think this year, legitimately, maybe since O'Reilly and Evander Kane's mm-hmm. first full season, that Sabres fans expect playoffs and probably aren't crazy for expecting. Yeah. And they have the goods to back it up now. I think that's, uh, you know, safe to say at this point. Um, before we wrap up, Austin, just quick thoughts. The RJ patch is going to be on, uh, the Sabres jerseys all year, all year long. I know you wore it on our Rick Jenneret uh, tribute show, but, uh, obviously, you know, just, just a great tribute to RJ and I know they're going to do a lot for him this year. They're giving away those, uh, RJ way, um, uh, street signs tonight at the home opener. So, you know, obviously just a- a- more Rick Jenneret tributes, the better. Yeah, of course. I mean, let's, let's be honest. It's the patches are awesome um anything that you can attribute to rj is is a good thing he is you know i mean for the first generation of sabers fans they grew up with ted darling we grew up with rick Jenneret. can't say enough about the guy and you know the impact that he's had on pretty much every sabers fan since he's been around and like you just said any way you can honor him do it i don't there i don't think there's anything that's going too overboard this year with rj if you want to, the patches are great if you want to have an rj video tribute every home game do it because i don't think anyone would ever complain about it Absolutely not. So uh, Austin's analytics segment will be back at some point. There's not a whole a lot of analytics to talk about when we haven't even had a, a first game of the regular season yet. So um, Austin's going to be bringing us that segment uh, throughout the season. And we'll be look forward to bringing you more content throughout uh, the Sabre season, reacting to the games and kind of how the team's doing. And uh, we look forward to, uh, you know, bringing you that all season long as this team is, is a fun team to watch. So thank you to everybody for tuning in to a longer episode. The, all the episodes might not be this long, but uh, the season preview show for the Buffalo Sabres right here on Sabre Semantics, proudly brought to you by JNO Flooring, as always, right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. So until next time, enjoy the Sabres home opener in the first week of the season of the NHL. It's like Christmas morning for all of us. Look forward to it. So for Austin Broad, my name is Brandon Caputo, and we'll talk to you guys again very soon. You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network.